Welcome back to Green is Good. We're so excited today to have with us Gene Bauer. He's the president and co-founder of the Farm Sanctuary. Welcome to Green is Good, Gene. Hello, it's great to be with you. Hey, you know, Gene, you are doing amazing and wonderful and great things at the Farm Sanctuary, and we're going to get into that today, and we're going to talk about it. But, you know, you've been called by Time Magazine, the conscience of the food movement. I'm a vegan, as my listeners know. I've shared that story many times with our listeners. And before we get talking about the Farm Sanctuary and all the wonderful work you're doing there... Please share, though, the Gene Bauer journey and story leading up to the creation of the Farm Sanctuary. Well, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, California, and I grew up eating meat without really thinking about it. But I also wanted to make a positive difference in the world. And so in high school, I started volunteering at Children's Hospital. And then in college, I started working with adolescents who were having difficulties, started working with environmental organizations and health organizations. And as time went, I came to recognize that factory farming was an issue that was just not getting the kind of attention it needed to get. So in the early 1980s, I started looking more into that. And I went vegan in 1985 when I learned that I could live and be healthy without eating other animals. And I felt that if I could live well without causing unnecessary harm and violence to other animals, why wouldn't I do that? So I did that in 1985. Wow. And then in 1986, I co-founded Farm Sanctuary and just started visiting farms to see firsthand what was going on. And we would literally find living animals thrown in trash cans or living animals thrown on piles of dead animals. So we started rescuing them and caring for them. And at the time, we were in a little row house in Wilmington, Delaware. So we didn't have farms. We didn't have a lot of space. But we we took care of the animals that we were able to rescue. And then we found Mm -hmm. good homes for them and placed them. And then as time went, it became apparent that there were lots of animals that needed help, that these animals became ambassadors, and were, were, we were able to educate people about the cruelty of our food animal system by telling the animal stories. And then we also started working on advocacy efforts to prevent the problem in the first place and to stop the systemic exploitation of animals for food. So it's been a journey, and I'm still on the journey, continuing to learn and to figure out how to live in a way that is aligned with compassionate values, which I think is very important, and also that it's healthy and, you know, leaves a light footprint on the planet. So Mm. I feel very lucky to be doing this work. It's meaningful. I feel like I'm making a positive difference in the world. And that's really what ultimately brought me to this place. I I always wanted to make a positive difference, and I feel very lucky to be where I am right now at Farm Sanctuary. What a great, great story. And for our listeners out there that want to learn more about the Farm Sanctuary and all of Gene's great work, please go to www.farmsanctuary.org. I'm on your site right now, Gene, and it is very educational, very colorful and beautiful and very, um, you know, eye-opening in many ways. And, um, you know, I'm one of your fans without even knowing you because I've read for years all the great exposés that you've led in terms of investigative journalism and investigative reporting with regards to what's going on in America's slaughterhouses and beyond. Can you share with our listeners some of the uh, important and um, um, eye-opening facts, uh, what they don't understand, what's really going on in today's industrial farms across the United States right now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, in farming today, the animals are seen primarily as commodities, not as living, feeling creatures. And so you have animals being raised by the thousands in these warehouses. And in some cases, they're packed into cages and crates so tightly that they can't even turn around or stretch their limbs. And they'll live this way practically their whole lives. In in the case of the production of veal, for example, calves, you know, are taken from their mothers immediately at birth and they're chained by the neck in these small wooden crates where they can't walk, they can't turn around, and they live that way their whole lives until they're slaughtered. And and they're not the only animals that suffer that way. The pigs that are used for breeding live most of their lives in two-foot-wide metal gestation crates, and then egg-laying hens who are exploited in egg production are packed into these wire cages so tightly they can't even stretch their wings. They constantly scrape against the bars of their cages. Their feathers wear off. They end up with bruises and abrasions on their bodies, and they'll live this way for over a year. 
And then after they're no longer considered to be profitable by the industry, they call them spent hens. And then they're killed. Sometimes they go to slaughterhouses, but increasingly slaughterhouses don't want them because these are very skinny birds that are not in very good shape. So sometimes these birds are just killed and and ground up literally uh, at the egg factories when they're no longer wanted. So this is an industry that is completely disrespectful of other animals. And when people see it, they don't think it's okay. And, And that's the big part of our effort is to educate people about what is happening to animals in the food production system and then to con- encourage consumers to eat in a way that they feel good about instead of saying, I don't want to hear about it because it's upsetting. I think people should take responsibility and think about the way that we as consumers live and what we support by our food choices and then make choices that are aligned with our own compassionate values and to support a more compassionate life for us and for all the animals on the planet. Gene, is, is, is it true that farm animals feel the same core emotions that human beings do with regards to pleasure, sadness, excitement, resentment, all those kind of emotions? Absolutely. Farm animals are very similar to us and similar to cats and dogs wow. and other animals. They have emotions. They have complex uh, cognitive abilities. Uh, They develop relationships. We have animals that get to know, get very close to other individuals. And, and when their, their friend is dies and they're no longer around, Mm. the animals grieve because they miss their friend. And so, yeah, they have all the emotions that humans have. And, you know, we're just starting to understand that the more we look, the more we recognize that farm animals are not that different than us. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is incredible, and I'm so glad you are sharing that with our listeners today. You know, as, as, as you and I were talking off the air before um, we, we before the show started, uh, we're both vegans. And can you share a little bit about what's going on in terms of some of the more um, recent trends in the United States with regards to meat consumption dropping 10% in the past uh, few years? And um, uh, what, 15 million or so Americans, 15 million Americans have stopped eating meat entirely. And celebrities such as Bill Clinton and um, even Jay-Z and others have sworn off of meat or become full-on vegans. What's going on with this trend or what uh, might we even say what is now uh, a mega trend? Yeah, well, as you point out, meat consumption is dropping in the U.S., and I think that's a a very positive sign. And I think it shows that people are now starting to recognize that this system is cruel, and it's also unhealthy, and it's unnecessary. We can live without eating other animals. And the way we have been raised in the U.S. to eat animal foods and processed foods is leading to significant health problems. And people like Bill Clinton, for example, recognize that if he went off of meat and dairy products, his health would improve, and it has improved. The experts estimate that we could save something like 70% on our health care costs by shifting to a whole food plant-based diet. 70%, that's an enormous amount of money. And as our economy struggles, I think that there's going to be more and more incentives to move away from a wasteful system and to eat food that is good for us and isn't going to cost a lot in healthcare, and also a food system that is much more efficient. Raising animals for food requires enormous quantities of resources, water, fossil fuel, land. We could feed something like 10 times more people on a plant-based diet. So it just makes all the sense in the world to stop exploiting animals for food, stop causing this enormous suffering, stop exploiting resources and and squandering scarce resources, and improve our own health and save on health care costs. It makes all the sense in the world when you start looking at it. I think that's starting to happen now. So people like Bill Clinton, as you mentioned, Jay-Z and Beyonce, kind of vegan lifestyle. Uh, Recently, J-Lo announced that she went vegan. Uh, This is a trend, but I think it's more than that. It's it's a growing awareness. And the fact that we have the Internet now and people share information on Facebook, share pictures and videotapes of factory farms, uh, and also share recipes and, and information about what people can do to make a difference, 
So all of these resources are now available more than ever before, and that's making a huge difference. And how many years, Gene, have you been a, a vegan yourself? Well, I went vegan in 1985, so it'll be 30 years very soon. So, and I feel very good. You know, I'm in my early 50s now, and going vegan was one of the best things I ever did. Well, you know, the science is irrefutable when it comes to veganism and eating a, 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 the vegan way. But one of the fun things we talked about at the top of the show before we went on the air is your involvement with, um, you know, have, you've become an Ironman, Ironman triathlete. Can you share a little bit about why you took up that avocation uh, in your early 50s? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, a lot of times people grow up believing that we need to have meat for protein or we need to drink cow's milk for calcium. And those are myths. We can get everything we need from plant foods and without any animal foods. And so I just wanted to demonstrate that not only can we live and survive, but we can thrive on the plant-based diet. So I signed up to do some triathlons a couple of years ago, started running marathons a couple of years ago. Wow. and just wanted to show that as a longtime vegan, you can perform these significant endurance feats. So I've yeah. run four marathons now, and every single time I've run one, I've done it in a time that qualifies for Boston. In fact, I just did the Boston Marathon last April. Wow. And then I've done a number of triathlons. This is where you swim, and then you bike, and then you run. And right. I did an Ironman last July, which involved swimming 2.4 miles, biking oh. 112 miles, and then running a 26.2-mile marathon. And I did all that in less than 12 hours. And so, vegan, um, so I just wanted to make the point that vegans get all the nutrients we need, and we can do marathon, triathlon, the professional football players that are now vegan. So this lifestyle makes a lot of sense, and it can fuel high-level athletic performance. For our listeners who just joined us, we've got Gene Bauer on with us today. He's the president and co-founder of the Farm Sanctuary. And to learn more about the Farm Sanctuary and support their great, great efforts on all of our behalfs, please go to www.farmsanctuary.org. You mentioned a little while ago, Gene, how factory farming negatively affects the environment. Can you scientifically break that down a little bit so our listeners understand, so we all understand more about the negative effects of factory farming and, and, and how that uh, has affected us, uh, impacted us all in a bad way, environmentally speaking? Certainly. A few years ago, the United Nations put out a report called Livestock's Long Shadow. And in that report, they talked about how the livestock industry is one of the top contributors to the serious environmental problems we're facing on the planet today. And these things, this includes things like the loss of biodiversity, the squandering of water and other scarce resources, contributions to climate change. The livestock industry contributes more to climate change than the entire transportation industry. So it's really mm -hmm. good that people are walking and carpooling and using public transportation and, and doing things to lighten our footprint when it comes to transportation. But we could have a greater impact by changing the way we eat and choosing mm. to eat plant food instead of animal food. And then the other thing about this industry is that it requires enormous amounts of resources. There was an article in the New York Times a few years ago called Rethinking the Meat Cuddler. And in that mm. article, the author compared the amount of fossil fuels needed for a vegetarian meal versus a meat meal. And he found it took 16 times more fossil fuels for the meat meal. So this is wasteful in terms of fossil fuels, wasteful in terms of land and water resources. And, you know, if you think about it, growing food, corn and soybeans, for example, harvesting that and then feeding that to animals takes a lot of energy. We right. could be growing corn and soybeans and other plant foods and just eating them directly, and we would get a lot more calories per acre per energy input by eating plants directly instead of animals. And then the other mm. thing is that when you can find these animals in factory farms, you end up with vast quantities of manure that then gets into mm. the environment and pollutes it. Mm. And not only are we talking about organic matter and waste in mm. huge quantities that the environment can't, can't absorb, we're also talking about chemicals, antibiotics, and other things that the animals are given to make them grow faster. Things like arsenic even. Animals are mm. given arsenic in their feed, which is, oh. you know, people are surprised to learn this. So 
the manure includes these toxins as well as uh, the, the, the waste, the, the pathogens that come in fecal matter anyway. So it's, it's a huge problem. Wow. You know, Gene, I, we're down to the last four minutes or so, and I want to focus on some uh, some solutions because you've been doing this so long and you're so um, uh, inspirational with how you guide us all through this uh uh, story and not only the problem but the solutions that are out there and, and which uh, has to part partially which is all of us becoming more conscious on how we eat what is what are some simple ways everyone can help protect animals from cruelty in their daily lives some of your some of your thoughts after doing this for 30 years or so well the best thing each of us can do is to be more mindful about the way we eat and to make choices that are compassionate and aligned with our own values and also to eat food that is good for us instead of food that makes us sick. And so that means shifting towards a plant-based diet and eating more vegetables, fruits, full grains, legumes. And it's not that hard. You can even get vegan food at fast food places. You can get a, a bean burrito, for example, with no cheese. Huh? Um, and in, for a spaghetti meal, instead of putting meatballs, how about putting veggies in there with a the spaghetti? Or you can also get meatless meatballs. So there's right. tons and tons of alternatives now to meat products. So shifting in that direction makes sense. Also, when there's legislation introduced, it's important to weigh in. Uh, the only way that laws are going to change and improve is for people to get involved. And people can go to the Farm Sanctuary website, farmsanctuary.org, for updates and information about current legislative efforts. Hey, let's talk. You know, we're down to a couple, um, couple minutes, Gene. Talk about the three locations in New York and California. Uh, the farm sanctuary locations. When p- if people go to them, if our listeners want to go uh, to them, what are they going to see when they go to? And what are the, what's the experience going to be like when they go to your farm sanctuaries? It, it's a wonderful experience. At farm sanctuary, the animals are our friends, not our food. Mm. It's a peaceful place where you get to know animals in a positive setting, and, and the animals get to be who they are. Cows get to run out graze, and they play, and, and pigs get to wallow in the mud chickens perch, and these animals have joyful lives, and being around them, you can feel that joy, and that's a huge contrast to what happened in factory farms, where the animals are clanking against the bars of their cages, the stench is horrible, so it, it's a peaceful place, and so we have one in Watsonsville, New York, which is in the Finger Lakes region, it's not far from Ithaca, New York, and then we have two farms in California, one in Northern California, in the city of Orland, and one in Southern California, just outside of Los Angeles. And for people interested in visiting, they can go to our Farm Sanctuary website, which is just farmsanctuary.org, and bring friends. Another good thing for people to do is just to educate others about these issues. And when people come visit Farm Sanctuary, they often go home with stories about how a chicken came and sat on their lap, or how a cow came up and wanted to be petted just like a dog. And, and those are really special experiences that we love for people to share. Got it. You know... Um, Gene, we're down to the last uh, minute or so. Um, and, you know, in 2008, you wrote a book, Farm Sanctuary, Changing Hearts and Minds About Animals and Food. This is the time. Can you please share any, um, uh, any of your thoughts as a follow-up to that book to where we're going as a society? If Bill Clinton has become a vegan, and we know how much he loved his burgers and other types of junk food, you know, it was well chronicled while he was a president. Where are we going to go? Give In the last minute or so, give us a little uh, crystal ball, your crystal ball on our future. Well, I think that people will continue moving away from consuming animal products as they learn about the harms caused by our animal farming system. And we are seeing a growth in farmers' markets across the country. Uh, mm-hmm. That is a very positive sign. And it's been driven by consumer demand and interest in eating foods that are healthier, eating foods that come from more sustainable farms, and eating foods that are less violent. So I think that this trend away from factory farming and towards wholesome plant foods will continue, will grow. Um, We're also seeing more and more vegan restaurants and vegan food available at non-vegan restaurants. So that's another positive trend. So as it gets easier to eat plant foods, I think consumers are going to eat more plant foods. And ideally... You know, this whole factory farming animal industry will stop. Uh, we've got a long way to go. This is a very entrenched industry, uh, sort of like the tobacco industry. But it's one that causes harm, one that produces a product that we don't need and is actually bad for us and bad for 
the environment and bad for animals. So I can see the meat industry going the way of the tobacco industry, uh, which, you know, isn't gone yet, uh, but it's widely seen as harmful. And uh, I think Thank- that was- well, thank you, Gene. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for all the amazing work you've been doing at the Farm Sanctuary. For our listeners out there, please go to their website, farmsanctuary.org, and support all of Gene and his colleagues' great work. Gene Bauer, thank you for being the responsible conscience of the food movement and for protecting our animals and people coast to coast. You are truly living proof that green is good. <laughs>